Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Next week, SpaceX is going to launch their first proper interplanetary mission. And I can tell you that I'm hoping, I'm crossing my fingers that this will crash. At least not on launch, right? This is the double asteroid redirect test. And this is a space mission which is ultimately, and I mean ultimately, going to crash into an asteroid and hopefully change its orbit. So yeah, this is SpaceX's first proper interplanetary mission. I say proper because SpaceX have actually launched a couple of payloads into interplanetary space. Most of what SpaceX does is in near and low Earth orbit and geostationary orbit, and maybe the odd thing that goes to the moon. But they, of course, launched Starman in the uh, Tesla Roadster off into interplanetary space. It went out to you know roughly the it's part of the, the inner edge of the asteroid belt. But the thing was, it was never targeted at a specific object. And when you're saying interplanetary, that means going between planets, right? There's also uh, Discover, right? And Discover was, of course, a satellite that was built in the you know in the 90s, and then Dick Cheney put it in a your warehouse <laughs> and then it got pulled back out put on a rocket and launched out to the l1 point which sits between the earth and the sun and again interplanetary mission sort of but it isn't actually going between planets so it doesn't count so this is the first proper interplanetary mission and it's even more proper because it's actually going to hit the target rather than just fly past so yeah why are they doing this? They want to demonstrate the ability to change the orbit of an asteroid. More importantly, they actually want to measure just how well this works. Because if you've got an asteroid and you don't know what it's made of, asteroids tend to be kind of soft and crumbly, it turns out. When you hit it with an object which uh, is going at you know 15,000 miles per hour and it weighs about half a ton, you're going to have a lot of energy involved and some of that energy might blow pieces off and that might carry momentum away with it. You might get a shockwave that travels through it and blows out stuff the other side like a, you know, Newton's cradle. So what, what I'm saying is that this is something to actually measure those effects and see what happens. So this is why I'm interested in it. The thing is, DART itself it really is more of a technology demonstrator mission with this ultimate goal in mind. And what I'm saying is that they put a lot of new hardware on it to see whether this hardware works the way it expects in deep space. Uh, for example, the solar arrays. Well, those are based on the rollout solar array, which was tested on the International Space Station, and they've now got the even more advanced version, but they've never tested them in deep space. And there's going to be segments of these solar arrays which are going to use uh, what are called transformational solar array elements. Those are like mirrors that will reflect the light onto the solar cells so that you have lower mass solar panels getting more power output from them. There's a new antenna system called the radial uh, line slot array. Again, something's been tested but hasn't been tested on a spacecraft. There's the, the next engine, right? the next uh, NASA evolutionary xenon thruster. And that hasn't been tested, so it's going to fly, but it's not going to be its main propulsion. And there's an interesting story behind that I'll have to tell. And then there's Draco, right? That's the Didymus Reconnaissance Asteroid Camera for Optical Navigation, right? That's basically a camera based, uh, based on LORI, which was the camera used on New Horizons. This is going to be on the spacecraft and it's going to be pointed at the asteroid so they can steer it right through the last 60 minutes and make sure they hit that target. Because when you're flying in deep space, you can't afford to have somebody back at mission control steering you. You have to do this entirely autonomous. So the DART mission was funded a few years ago as a low-cost technology demonstrator. And one of the ways they were going to make it low-cost was that it was going to ride along as a secondary payload on another satellite going to geostationary orbit. So it would be dropped into this highly elliptical geostationary transfer orbit, and then it would use its ion engine, the next thruster, to slowly raise the orbit, escape into interplanetary space, and ultimately set course for Didymus. As it happened, when they put it out to bid, the lowest bidder was SpaceX, who bid $69 million. And they said, you know what, we will give it a dedicated mission, which means there's no, no longer any reason to perform this slow spiral outwards. So it's actually going to launch from Vandenberg uh, Tuesday night, 
It's going to head off into a parking orbit and then about 40 minutes later over the Indian Ocean it's going to fire the main engines on the second stage and that will lift it out into its uh, escape trajectory. And they will actually perform a few tests of the ion thruster even although it's not really necessary for the mission but they do need to demonstrate it and test it to show that the engine actually works in deep space. Uh, the ultimate destination is an asteroid known as Dimorphos which is the moon of another asteroid called Didymus. So Didymus was discovered in the late 1990s and it comes close to the Earth quite regularly. It goes out to about 2.2 AU and then comes in very close to the Earth's orbit. It's not dangerous, but it is considered a potentially hazardous asteroid because on long time scales, its orbit can cross the Earth. Now, because it comes so close, it could get hit by planetary radar. And when using the planetary radar, they discovered that it had a moon. So the name was proposed was Didymus because Didymus apparently means uh, you know, twin. And the little moon, well, everybody's been calling it Diddy Moon and I still call it Diddy Moon, but apparently its official name is Dimorphos. So I guess I'm gonna have to call it that. And it's the small moon that we're gonna hit, right? The mission's called Double Asteroid Redirect Test. Well, this is two asteroids. And there's a good reason why you would choose to hit to uh, a second asteroid. So Didymus is the main object is about 0.8 kilometers across. Uh, the estimated mass is about 500 million tons probably. The moon Dimorphos is about 170 meters across. It orbits about 1.2 kilometers out. That's about three quarters of a mile. And it takes about 12 hours to complete a complete orbit. That means if you think about it, it's moving at about, it's moving at less than 10 centimeters per second, less four inches per second. It's moving about that speed, right? It is not moving particularly fast. And that's actually important because if you, this object is five million tons. It's comparable to the size of the Great Pyramids. So imagine driving a light car into the Great Pyramid. You're not gonna move it very much, okay. Imagine driving a car into it at six kilometers per second. It's going to make a bit of a, you know, it's going to make a big bang. And it turns out if you do the math, you know, Newton's conservation of momentum, this will actually change the velocity by about half a millimeter per second. And we're not sure about exactly how much because when it hits, it's going to blast stuff off and it'll carry momentum off in different ways. Um, you might get some wave that propagates through and blows material off the other side. We're really trying to measure how well the momentum of this object couples to this small asteroid. But half a millimeter per second, that's quite a small value to measure. And that is sort of the core reason why they chose to do, to use a double asteroid. See, back uh, about 20 years ago, I think the European Space Agency was talking about doing a similar test and it was realized that measuring this kind of precision would be extraordinarily hard. I mean, for comparison, the asteroid Apophis was considered a potential threat to Earth and we needed to figure out its exact position. And there was a really long concert, concentrated campaign to figure out exactly where it was. You know, they had to use radar, telescopes, they even had to wait for it to pass in front of other stars. And when you do that, you get extraordinarily accurate information. They figured out its location to within about three kilometers. Now, if you adjust an asteroid's velocity by one millimeter per second, that's about 30 kilometers over a whole year. So you would have to have that kind of campaign to that level of precision to measure the asteroid before and then measure it afterwards to see that it had changed enough. Uh, another way to do it, the way that Europe wanted to do it, was to have a two spacecraft system. You would have one spacecraft would go out and sit next to the asteroid and analyze it and look at it and get to know it, be its friend. And while it was distracting this asteroid, the other spacecraft would come in and whack it and the thing is, because the spacecraft have their own transponders and navigation gear on board, they can very accurately measure where they are in space. So they could measure this very small change in velocity. Now, the idea of doing it with a double asteroid, it changes the equation because now you're no longer measuring the change in velocity with an asteroid in deep space. 
it now has another asteroid next to it. And so you're going from measuring velocities of kilometers per second to measuring velocities of you know, 10 centimeters per second. And that means that it's now like a fraction of a percent. It's much more easy to see the difference. What it'll do is it will change the period of this orbit from about 12 hours to maybe 12, you know, like 11 hours and 45 minutes or something. It's going to be quite a small change, but it will be measurable because the met, it'll be add up over time. And so that's why you can do this as a single mission. There was another mission proposed called AIDA, where the European Space Agency wanted to send a spacecraft there beforehand and do all the measurement and then retreat and watch the whole cool event. That never got funded. We do have, however, a ride-along mission called Licia Cube, and that's an Italian CubeSat that's going to have cameras focused on this event. It's going to launch about 10, 10 days beforehand. It's going to you know, drop out of the main spacecraft, and that means it'll arrive about three minutes later. So it will be able to see a dart smash into this object, ideally. It'll see the plume produced. It'll collect scientific data. It'll beam that home directly, and then, of course, it will, it will die. Um, it has two cameras on it to measure the force of this impact. Luke and Leia. Yes, I'm not making that up. And thankfully, the European Space Agency has actually funded a follow-up mission called HERA, and that will launch in, I think, 2024. It will get there in 2027, and that will actually visit the asteroid. It'll orbit. It'll take a look at the big hole that's been made in Didymoon, and hopefully, you know, we'll get some science out of this. So look, I'm obviously extraordinarily excited about this because I've always been an asteroid fan. I've been fascinated by asteroids ever since The Empire Strikes Back, which is obviously not very accurate representation of asteroids, but to a six, seven-year-old, it was the thing that got me hooked. And now we are going to be flying into an asteroid field, and hopefully the odds of this impact are a little bit better than 3,720 to 1. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.